Thank you for your interest. And uh, this was actually some case studies that were um, produced by our uh, residents. Um, we had a pediatric endocrine fellow who comes through every January. And then we also have um, uh, our resident uh, in pathology. So I want to go through um, basically three cases with ketosis due to different causes, uh, kind of review ketone bodies and the pathophysiology of diabetes, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, and then identify some of the clinical utility of beta-hydroxybutyrate as a, an analyte in the laboratory. Um, so the first case I want to cover is actually a, a pediatric, a 13-year-old, Caucasian female. Um, she's uh, overweight has no past medical history, uh, family history of type 1 diabetes, and she's uh, going to her primary care practitioner uh, with a two-week history of polydipsia, polyuria, a 20-pound weight loss. Uh, she seems to not, her big complaint to the primary care practitioner was she couldn't get enough to drink, she was waking up several times at night to urinate. And at the physician's office, she had a capillary glucose of about uh, 444 milligrams per deciliter. And a urinalysis done at the physician's office was uh, four plus ketones. So she was transferred to our emergency department. And uh, her pH was low. She was acidotic, had a high serum glucose. Uh, her bicarb uh, was uh, very low. So uh, her anion gap was up. Um, she had a high beta-hydroxybutyrate, it was 8.46, and uh, the normal range for those of you who aren't familiar with it is 0 to 0 0.27 millimoles per liter. So this was orders of magnitude above uh, the normal range. And her sodium was 137, 141 when you correct it for um, hyperglycemia. Now the second case we want to talk about is an African-American female, 58-year-old, uh, no previous history of diabetes. She shows up in the emergency room with one week history of fatigue, polyuria, polydipsia, blurry vision. Again, her capillary uh, glucose, glucose meter was 300. Uh, her hemoglobin A1C was 16.1%. And again, uh, this was a little bit of a higher anion gap, not as high as the last one was 33. Uh, but her ketones uh, and glucose were plus four by dipstick, and the beta-hydroxybutyrate was in the 6.86 range. Again, very elevated. Then we have case three here. This is a 57-year-old Caucasian male. He has poorly controlled type two diabetes he's been diagnosed with. His past uh, history of uh, reflux esophagitis alcohol abuse, cirrhosis. He comes to the emergency room uh, with vomiting uh, blood, abdominal pain. He has a recent history of increased alcohol consumption, has not been eating or taking his insulin. Uh, I guess he just forgot as he was drinking. So uh, his pH was borderline at the low, again in the acidotic uh, range, but borderline in the norm, uh, low normal. Glucose was elevated, but not as elevated as the previous ones. Uh, bicarb was very low, anion gap super high, lactate was up, beta-hydroxybutyrate you can see was elevated about 10 times the normal limit, uh, blood alcohol of 209 which is quite impressive, and uh, <laughs> ketones was 2 plus. So it just kind of brings home as you look at these pictures and the similarities between three different cases, um, three different uh, people showing up in the emergency room with uh, similar and dissimilar um, uh, analytes, uh, they all kind of surround the ketone bodies. And in all of these cases, these patients had elevated ketone bodies. So what is a ketone body? Well, it's actually, a, there are three of them. They are water-soluble compounds produced by byproducts when fatty acids are actually metabolized or broken down by the liver. It's beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, and acetone. Acetone is volatile. Beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate are not. Um, so they are stable in serum after processed. You don't have to re uh, remember to keep the cap on. They're not like ethanol in other words. Um, normally, when the body breaks down ketones, uh, they break them down into CO2 and H2O. But the buildup of ketones causes an acid imbalance, and that's where you get the ketone bodies. Both ketone bodies, actually, if you look at this, oops, let me go back here, because I don't have a, a pointer. If you look at the beta-hydroxybutyrate, it's butyric acid. 
Uh, so that gives you the, uh, the acid that uh, um, is the unbound or unrecognized um, in the anion gap. So it is one of the elements that is causing the increased L uh, anion gap along with the acetic acid. If it's not diagnosed and treated, ketoacidosis can be fatal. Um, I do want to point out that in normal patients, acetoacetate to beta-hydroxybutyrate ratio is normally about one to one, but when you go into ketoacidosis, um, acetoacetate to beta-hydroxybutyrate is about a one to six ratio, meaning beta-hydroxybutyrate outnumbers acetoacetate and acetone by about a six to one ratio. Beta-hydroxybutyrate, in other words, is favored in the ketosis states. So I want to point out here that actually these are byproducts of metabolism. And whether you are actually in the absence or presence of insulin, if you're in the presence of insulin, you actually are uh, building um, uh, and putting yourself into uh, basically an anabolic type of state. You're digesting glucose. Insulin allows glucose to go into the cells and be actively utilized. And in the liver, you're actually in a state of gluconeogenesis, meaning that you're taking glucose and you're storing it for long time use. So that when you go into a starvation or when you are not eating, you can then break down those uh, uh, stored glucose and continue to have glucose for the brain metabolism. But when you are in a starvation situation and your glucose uh, uh, can't uh, be utilized because you, you are not taking in a lot of carbohydrates, you're basically in an absence of insulin and you're no longer utilizing glucose as your primary energy source, you're actually utilizing uh, fatty acids. And it is the breakdown of the fatty acids that leads to the beta-hydroxybutyrate. So you can see from the TCA cycle, uh, free fatty acids comes into acetyl-CoA, uh, and if you have oxygen, if you're in a catabolic state and actually uh, metabolizing all of this well, you actually will break down those fatty acids to CO2 and H2O with the byproduct of ATP that can be used for energy stores. But uh, if you don't have and you've overwhelmed the TCA cycle, which can happen as you're going in and using uh, fatty acid stores, instead you break down acetyl-CoA into HMG-CoA uh, and eventually into acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate. So what is diabetes? Diabetes is actually chronic high blood sugar. Uh, it's uh, uh, in long-term uh, uh, risk of um, uh, uh, putting glucose and binding glucose to your proteins. You actually can have cardiovascular problems. Uh, you can have uh, protein issues that cause blindness, uh, circulatory problems. So all of these, the retinopathy, the nephropathy, the neuropathies, all of these are microvascular complications of proteins that have been glycosylated over a long period of time. In type 1, primarily uh, pediatric, your diagnosis as a child, uh, it's previously termed insulin uh, dependent or juvenile onset diabetes. This is an immune mediated type of cause. In other words, your pancreatic cells that release and store insulin and release it upon a, a, a meal, that's damaged by antibody action. So an autoimmune type of reaction against those cells. So you don't have enough insulin in the body and that's where the problem is coming from. As opposed to type two, which is called non-insulin dependent diabetes or adult onset, this is um, where your cells become refractory to insulin. Because you have a constant state of high glucose, you're constantly pumping out a lot of insulin, your cells become refractory to it. So in other words, uh, eventually your um, pancreas shuts down and stops producing and releasing the insulin. So it is a different cause, but both of these are due to an imbalance in insulin and a response uh, to insulin. Diabetic ketoacidosis is a life-threatening complication of untreated diabetes. Insulin deficiency and stress hormones combine to cause DKA, and it was once the leading cause of death amongst type 1 diabetics, primarily seen in type 1 diabetics, although type 2 can also show um, DKA. 
Still a very high mortality rate, particularly even in developed nations like America. Five to 10% of patients showing up in the ED who have DKA can end up in a fatal uh, uh, problem. It's characterized by a, a kind of trifecta of hyperglycemia, acetosis, and ketone bodies. Now, ketone bodies, as I mentioned before, in DKA, beta-hydroxybutyrate accounts for about 75% of the ketones, uh, outnumbers acetoacetate and acetone by about a 6 to 1 ratio. Greater than about 0 0.27 millimoles per liter is abnormal. Historically, ketoacidosis is diagnosed, monitored in urine and serum with nitroprusside, the urine-based test. But there's a problem with urine-based tests. They're not as, uh, um, while they may be equally sensitive, they're not as specific to uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate as uh, a direct analyte would be. The keto sticks, the ACE test, and again, there's been problems in marketing the ACE test and getting this ACE test, uh, which is also driving a lot of uh, uh, physicians to be using more the direct marker, the beta-hydroxybutyrate. But the problem is they're colorimetric. They're uh, kind of semi-qualitative at best, and uh, you get that uh, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus type of uh, reading. The other problem with this is that they don't, they're, they're more specific for acetoacetate, and they don't detect beta-hydroxybutyrate. So they're not really detecting the predominant ketone body in DKA. And these are what they look like. I think many of you are familiar with these and have used these in the laboratory. Um, the nitroprusside reaction I show at the top um, actually <laughs> forms this colored compound that is purple. So it changes from a, a clear compound, a kind of yellowish, to a bright purple in the presence of acetoacetate. And they're um, marketed under a number of different names. ACE test, the keto diet stick. Uh, you have the, the tablets that you can add serum or urine to in a, a test tube. Or you also have the multi-sticks types of formats where it is one of the pads on a, a multi-analyte uh, urine dipstick. Now, ketone bodies and severe ketoacidosis, I mentioned about that beta-hydroxybutyrate to acetoacetate uh, ratio shifting. And the problem when you use um, dipsticks, it depends at what stage the person comes in. Because if they're in diabetic ketoacidosis, the uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate is going to far outweigh the acetoacetate. And then, remember the metabolic pathway, um, as it reverses and as beta-hydroxybutyrate goes down, you're going to see this rise in acetoacetate. So there is almost a lag as during treatment where you may actually see a rise in the dipstick response and a decrease in the beta-hydroxybutyrate, which more directly prevails treatment, the rehydration, the removal of the um, acidosis situation. So that's why I mentioned here that the fall of acetoacetate lags behind the improvement in ketoacidosis. Drugs can also cause a false positive nitroprusside test. Now, the different methodologies that you can actually measure. I mentioned about nitroprusside, but there's the several limitations. You can have false negatives because it doesn't detect the primary ketone body, beta-hydroxybutyrate. And you can have false positives with drugs like L-DOPA, captopril, other ACE inhibitors that patients may be on if they're diabetic and they have high blood pressure. Gas chromatography, capillary electrophoresis, very specific for beta-hydroxybutyrate, but how many of us actually really have gas chromatography and capillary electrophoresis ready to go in the core laboratory? It's not real simple, not amenable to point-of-care type of strategies. And then you have the enzymatic. It's rapid, has minimal cross-reactivity with interfering drugs, and you can perform it in an automated analyzer type format in the main laboratory, or you can perform it on point of care testing devices, and there's a variety of those that are available now. The enzymatic methods, I can tell you, have a comparable sensitivity. It's about 98% um, uh, sensitive uh, to nitroprusside methods, but it's far superior in specificity. Here it's 79% versus 39, 35% for the nitroprusside test.
varying formats, as I mentioned. You can have uh, smaller meters that can be deployed outside of the laboratory, and you have the liquid reagents that can be put onto um, the analyzers. And again, ketosis is generally around that 0.3 millimolar per liter range. Now, I want to finish kind of and wrap up with this and with, uh, I'll come back to the cases, but I kind of want to summarize and leave you with some of the recommendation from professional consensus societies. The American Diabetes Association, in their guidelines that were released in January 2004, mentioned that blood ketone testing that quantifies beta-hydroxybutyric acid or beta-hydroxybutyrate, the predominant ketone body, are available and are preferred over urine ketone testing for diagnosis diagnosis and for monitoring treatment of ketoacidosis. And that home tests for beta-hydroxybutyrate are also available. And in 2011, they updated this in diabetes care, and their recommendations at that point in time said that blood ketone determinations that rely on the nitroprusside reaction should be used only as an adjunct to the diagnosis of DKA. They should never be used to monitor DKA treatment. Again, because acetoacetate is not reflective of the rehydration and the reversal of the, the acidosis in these situations. It lags behind beta-hydroxybutyrate in the met metabolic pathway. And specific measurement of beta-hydroxybutyric acid in blood can be used for diagnosis and for monitoring of the treatment. So let's go back and let's just summarize how these cases resolved. The first case was actually a case of diabetic ketoacidosis. This was the 13-year-old who showed up uh, to her primary care practitioner complaining of thirst and uh, frequent urination. She was positive for islet cell antibodies, which means that this confirmed a type 1 diabetes. So she was having an autoimmune response to her pancreatic cells. She received IV insulin. They transitioned her then in the hospital to subcutaneous insulin, and she had improved glycemia at that point. She was discharged home from the hospital with extensive diabetic education and teaching. And on a two-month follow-up after this, she's a healthy adolescent girl, teenager. Her hemoglobin A1C decreased from 11.3 at admission to now 8, so she's improving and on the right pathway. Her average two-week capillary glucose was 99 with the, the sub-Q insulin. And the, uh, the take-home message here is that diabetes diagnosis and education is vital as a key part to the treatment and prevention of another DKA episode. So this was her first um, foyer into um, the emergency room, and that was uh, where she was diagnosed <coughs> with the type 1 and she didn't have the symptomology before that, that age. Case two, this is a patient that presented with uh, diabetic ketoacidosis as well, but without evidence of latent autoimmune diabetes in adults, what's sometimes called LADA. The patient was negative for anti-glutamic acid decarboxylase antibody test, uh, which is a, a um, kind of marker for this uh, syndrome of latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. So what they're actually trying to figure out, the endocrinologist, is this diabetes because of patient's lifestyle, simply their genetics together with overeating, lack of exercise, and that uh, use of alcohol, or is this an autoimmune response against their pancreatic cells? Because they have to treat them very differently, and they have different risks and prognosis. So part of this testing here, the negative anti-glutamic acid decarboxylase, is to sift through some of these autoimmune versus uh, type 2 diabetes. This patient improved with multiple daily injections of insulin, was finally weaned and stopped uh, because they kept going into fasting hypoglycemic episodes. So they were getting too much insulin, actually, and they were responding with this. And it was almost as if their cells shocked back and came back and started responding again to insulin once they, they kind of gave her a little bit of a help for, the, for a couple of weeks. Within six months, her hemoglobin A1C improved from 16.2, which is rather impressive, down to 6.2. So she's almost now within the normal range um, without insulin and with just diet control. Her diagnosis was glucose toxicity of beta cells, 
uh, with euglycemia, that means normal glycemic, endogenous insulin secretion improved. So once they normalized her glucose, her insulin started coming back and her beta cells started pumping back out the insulin. Um, she was diagnosed with what we call ketosis prone diabetes, or what's called atypical diabetes, and it's um, typical of African Americans from a particular part of New York, Flatbush actually. It was some called, sometimes called Flatbush uh, syndrome or Flatbush diabetes. It's uh, diabetes type 1B, and it's uh, typical of the non Caucasian population. So it was interesting. I didn't know about this. Our resident didn't realize this. It came from one of our endo pediatric endocrine fellows who mentioned that uh, this particular syndrome is rather common, actually, um, and, and was identified in that population in New York. The prognosis really depends on their beta cell reserve and how functioning their islet cells are. So the presence of islet cell antibodies is a really bad prognosis with this because it means it's progressing more to a type 1 diabetes. So most undergo long-term improvement, insulin, total independence from insulin, but some will reflex back into these types of uh, DKA episodes. And those are the ones that have continued risk of relapse and may eventually go into insulin dependence. And the final case, I'll wrap up with a case of metabolic ketoacidosis overlaid on lactic acidosis caused by alcoholic uh, ketoacidosis, starvation ketoacidosis, and maybe a component of uh, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. Because this was the type 2 patient who was drinking, not taking their insulin, and not eating either. The treatment uh, actually uh, was with hydration. They started giving back insulin, and that resolved the acidosis within about 24 hours. And then the lactate levels eventually came back and declined. The patient was eventually transitioned to glargine insulin prior to discharge. So they switched their insulin, they got the patient eating, they got them hydrated, and it pretty much resolved. But the patient is diagnosed uh, type 2. So they need to take better care of themselves, and if they are going to drink a lot, they need to eat along with it and take their insulin. So <laughs> with summary, I want to say in the past, urine dipstick nitroprusside has historically been utilized to screen and monitor for diabetic ketoacidosis. It's still a widely marketed method, but it's qualitative, and it has a number of potential interferences. The present is really plasma or serum beta-hydroxybutyrate levels. They give more a direct quantitative measurement of blood ketones, can provide a better method of diagnosis and management of the ketosis from any cause, whether it's starvation, whether it's diabetic ketoacidosis, or it's another cause. Clinical applications of beta-hydroxybutyrate for screening diagnosis of ketosis in the setting of DKA, alcoholic ketoacidosis, or starvation-induced mm -hmm. ketosis are some of the applications. So with that, uh, I think I'll wrap it up and open it up for questions. You know, uh, again, it, comes, it has to be used in conjunction with the symptomology and what's going on. And I think a lot of the mentality is that it's part of a multi-dipstick. So I'm screening the patient for multiple things without having to try and figure out exactly what's going on with the patient. And in fact, there are some EDs I know that are, are dipping every person who walks in the ED simply because it's a screening method. They're looking for something that's abnormal. And and in many instances, the physicians don't even follow up with that. There was a study out of um, Australia, I believe, uh, several years ago, where it was customary policy that any patient admitted to the hospital got a, a, a urine dipstick. And they asked how many of those physicians actually followed up on the abnormal results from those dipsticks. And more than two-thirds of them never knew that they had an abnormal result from the dipstick. And the third that did realize about it, it was inconsequential. And it led them kind of down a wrong pathway because it wasn't a test that was part of their overall diagnostic scheme. They started chasing results, in other words, and there were more problems with false uh, positives on that dipstick than there was with true positives. So I think you know, that's something to think about uh, in terms of just doing blind screening of testing. We had, for instance, I can tell you uh, with glucose meters, one of our, uh, if you read the fine print on the glucose meter package inserts, 
all manufacturers. You should not be doing capillary glucose testing in patients that are in DKA with or without ketosis, in patients with severe dehydration, in patients in shock or circulatory insufficiency, which kind of rules out a lot of the intensive care patients because they all have circulatory insufficiency and problems. But the big problem was in RAD, they wanted to move patients quicker through the ED, so they thought if we dip everyone with a dipstick and we get a glucose meter reading on them, it'll speed their triage. And we warned them about the probability that they're going to get a misleading glucose in these types of patients with DKA. So we did a study and looked at them, and in fact, it was not so much the patients in DKA as it was the hyperosmolar non-ketotic types of conditions that were coming in, where we got widely different and discrepant results that misled the, pa the physician in the treatment of those patients. One patient I can remember was like 1,800 glucose in the main lab, and their glucose meter was like in the two to 300 range. And it never changed from the two to three for the next like three days of treatment until the patient got rehydrated and they got them out of that dehydration state. And they couldn't do it right away because you can send those patients into shock and kill them. You have to kind of gradually wean them back onto insulin, continue with the glucose infusion and a lot of hydration and monitor their electrolytes quite, quite readily. So I think it's a mentality. It's an old mindset. It's there. It was convenient. They think it's cheap. They don't understand kind of, you know, and I'm screening for a dozen different things all at once. Um, but it's not always the most effective as to go right to the test that you really need. It was not, you know, and we warned them not to use it on DKA patients in the emergency room as a general screening method. If they specifically know that this patient has circulatory insufficiency and they run into problems with the, uh, they're going to run into problems with the glucose meter. So trust the main laboratory or use a different device. Use something like an iStat or an Irma or a blood gas analyzer that's down there that looks at it more by a biosensor type of technology for the glucose rather than the test strip. And that was independent of manufacturer. We looked at a couple of different manufacturers, showed that same, same discrepancies. Now that's interesting because uh, what you say, I don't know that there's been a lot of research in this. And I, I say that because I'm going to talk about an off-label use of the, the beta-hydroxybutyrate. Um, I was at Hopkins and there's uh, Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, which is uh, pediatric uh, refractory epilepsy. These patients are, are on multiple medications or have tried multiple anti-epileptics to control their seizures. And the thing that seems to help these patients, it's interesting, is actually keeping them on a ketogenic diet, meaning sort of like the Atkins diet. So low carbs, high fat, and keep them in a range of ketosis that's not so high as they're in this like diabetic ketoacidotic range, but it was like in that normal to two range. And they actually utilized the beta-hydroxybutyrate method back at Hopkins, back in the 90s, I know when I was there, um, to titrate these patients' diets to keep them in that particular range. So I think what you're saying is, yes, there may be different ranges for different types of patients, but no, you don't expect that a diabetic should be running a normal ketosis if they're keeping their diet normal, if they're exercising, if they're taking their insulin, and that, that probably is not a normal situation. At which point do they get into danger? That's, that's a question. I think usually they don't show up in the ED until they get to such an extreme event that then it's very, very high by then. But does anyone know what they normally run? Is it normal for a diabetic who's asymptomatic to be running higher ketones than a non-diabetic patient? I don't know. And I'm sure it depends on their diets. Because I've seen advertisements, again, this is non-FDA labeled. I'm not going to advocate that you, you do this. But um, I've seen advertisements for the dipsticks, the nitroprusside or whatever, to monitor your ketosis to make sure that you're in this kind of anabolic type of state where you're actually metabolizing fats really well as a dietary aid. 
for people on like the Atkins or these high fat, low carb type diets. That's not an approved method and I don't think there's a target range there. So I wouldn't advocate that, but uh, certainly it is monitoring beta hydroxybutyrate from any cause is basically the bottom line that we're getting at. And then it's kind of the physician's responsibility and you as the laboratory to help the physician understand where's that coming from. Well, you have to remember that the American Diabetes Association is predominantly endocrinologists, and endocrinologists know the laboratory better than any other physicians, other than the pathologists who work in the laboratory. So they're very attuned to those types of tests. So I don't know how well they have gotten it out to the general practitioner. I think it's our responsibility to talk it up in our institutions and tell them about the benefits and disadvantages of each of the tests and what some of the applications are for it. I really don't know. We have dipsticks, obviously, for urine there. We have not run the ACE test for many years because we've had this uh, for the serum side of it. We have not done away with the dipsticks simply because they have other advantages. You know, they look for nitrite uh, for infections. And but on a serum-based test, you're not going to run the dipstick, No, we do not run it on the serum. I'm talking about the urine. Uh, you're talking about the, the meters that give uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate and a central laboratory method. Um, and again, I think it depends on the methodology. Uh, in general, they correlate fairly well. Um, but again, you're going to have to look at it at each individual. And then depending on the core platform, because there may be some slight matrix differences, depending on a Beckman analyzer, a Roche analyzer, an Abbott analyzer. That would be expected. And I think you might be able to tell by looking at the um, CAP survey a little bit. I don't advocate that because many of those CAP samples, the proficiency samples, are stabilized control type material. And because of that, they get matrix effects based on the different analyzers. So you're probably best when you bring it in, if you are running both methods, to make sure that you run a correlation between the two initially and then periodically to make sure that that stays the same correlation. But you see, it's so sensitive to beta-hydroxybutyrate in terms of the range of physiological that minor changes of 0.1 or 0.2 uh, biases are not a big deal and can easily be used to trend patients up or down, whether they're getting worse or they're getting better during treatment. I would think that they would want to run it, uh, particularly at the early stage while they're rehydrating them, probably once or twice a day, easily. And if they are not certain what's happening with the patient, to recheck it again. Do we get that from our physicians? No, not always. I'll be quite honest. You know, sometimes they do it at the beginning for diagnosis, and then they never monitor it again because they monitor their glucose and they monitor their electrolytes. To, to see if they're rehydrating. So they sort of go with that approach rather than using this. And I think it's still because it's very new to them. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you have a great rest of the conference.